see y'all here on this first Sunday in October. Uh, and as usual, I am always excited if I get the chance to open up our, our Sunday morning worship uh, standing here in this baptistry. Uh, and so today, uh, we've got my friend Teresa. She is coming forward to follow through in baptism. She made a decision to follow the Lord sometime back, but had never followed through in publicly declaring to the world that she was Jesus Christ through baptism. And so as she comes today, that is exactly what she is going to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the heater went out on us this, this week, so uh, we, it's a little chilly. <laughs> All right, Miss Teresa, three questions. First one, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. And do you believe that he died on the cross for your sins and rose again as your Savior? Yes. And do you promise to follow him the rest of your days? Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, then, Miss Teresa, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are buried in life with Christ and raised to walk. Amen. Woo! And everybody in the house said, Amen. Amen. Let's get on our feet. Let's worship together. Mighty to say, great Chris Thomas song. Here we go. <clears throat> Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. Our God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again, I give my life to follow, everything I believe in, now I surrender, yes I surrender. He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever Author of salvation He rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave Shine your light and let the whole world see We're singing for the glory of the risen King, Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King, Savior, He can move the 
mountains. Come on. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. You're my Savior. You can move the mountain. God, you are mighty to save. You are mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. You rose and conquered the grave. Yes, you conquered the grave. mighty to say Amen. You may be seated. We certainly want to welcome you to Highsville Baptist Church this morning. Uh, we're thrilled that you're here and hope you've had a great week. Uh, we hope you're strapped in for a great morning of, of praise and worship and wonderful preaching this morning. Uh, we're going to have a great time in the house of the Lord this morning and we start things off with uh, a new sister, Teresa, and uh, man, what an awesome way to start things off. So um, we're just going to look forward to a great uh, day in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, we especially want to welcome those who may be our guests this morning. If you have been here for the first time or the thousandth time, uh, you'll see on the bulletin there, you, we have a, uh, a connection card right here. It's actually just a tear-off. It's not a card, it's a tear-off. Uh, but if you'll uh, fill that out and just tear that off and slip that uh, in either of the gray offering boxes located on the back wall, uh, we will consider that your gift to us uh, this morning. We appreciate that. Uh, for any, and, and we kind of glanced by this a little bit, but there's a little important thing right down here at the bottom that says, how can we pray for you today? If you've got something that's on your heart and you want us to pray, us as a staff, us as a church, to pray over, Fill that out and tear that off. You don't even have to put your name on it if you don't want to. If it's an unspoken request that you've got something that's heavy on your heart, uh, we need to be a praying church. We need to be lifting each other up in prayer. So if there's something that we need to pray for you about, don't forget about that bottom portion because we kind of glance over that, and that's a very important part of who we are. Uh, so make sure that you do that as well. So uh, we're going to stand. We're going to start things off with the song. Uh, bless his heart. He needs some help because he hasn't been around very long and he needs our support. His name is William J. Gaither. I call him Billy. Uh, but anyway, let's stand together and sing because he lives. Here we go. God said.
Galatians 2, 20 and 21, the very familiar passage of Scripture says this, I, we, have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for it is righteousness that we were through the law, then Christ died no for no purpose. This is the great song called In Christ Alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. Are stilled when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in heaven. Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live ground his body lay light of the world in darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since Christ has lost final breath Jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can ever plug me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, I'd like to dismiss dismiss the kids for Children's Church at this time. So if you're a kid in Children's Church, y'all can be dismissed at this time. I don't have any day? Okay. Okay. You set me up for that, didn't you? (laughs) Sorry about that. That's right. This is Family Sunday. Okay. Um, I would like to get up here and uh, talk about tonight's service. Um, I'd like to invite you back for that. It's an OCC celebration. And this is the first time we've done this, and it's uh, going to show what God has done in this county over the past few years through Operation Christmas Child. And we're going to have a little bit of history about uh, uh, this ministry, Operation Christmas Child. It's a part of Samaritan's Purse, which is, you know, Franklin Graham's the, the you know, in charge of that, head of that. Um, we're going to have a couple of ladies from the area team come in and help me speak tonight and go over different areas. We're going to have some videos we're going to be watching uh, to get us more familiar with what's going on. And one of the things that's impressed me over the last couple of years, you know, here at Heightsville, we've been praying for unreached people groups. That's one of the target areas that uh, Operation Christmas Child has been working on the past few years, is to reach these unreached people groups. And one, one story stands out in my mind the chief of this, it was a voodoo uh, village, uh, didn't want any church in the, his area. Well, finally he gave in and had Operation Christmas Child come in and pass out shoe boxes to the kids. Well, in the meantime, he let, he let them tell about the story of Jesus. And since then, he has become a Christian. The village, they're putting up churches now in that village. He said, how can you know what sugar tastes like unless you taste it? So how can you know about the love of God unless you hear it? So, and that's one of the things that uh, Samaritan's Purse is is focusing on right now. So I believe it's going to be a fun event tonight. So I'd invite you to come back tonight at 6 o'clock and uh, celebrate with us. Amen. Thank you, Sam, for for telling us about that. And uh, a couple other things just to make you aware of as we continue in worship this morning. Uh, One is our revival coming up on October the 12th through the 16th. Uh, We're looking forward to starting that Wednesday night at 7 o'clock and uh, getting together each night, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night with the revival culminating at uh, Sunday morning at 1030 uh, as we worship together, I've, I've got an exciting group of pastors, friends of mine from across the state of Kentucky are going to be joining us, a different person each night, uh, coming to preach the word, bringing their worship team with them to worship with us. And so I am very much looking forward uh, to that uh, whole revival ending, of course, with our fall celebration at noon uh, that, that same Sunday morning. And so looking forward to that as well as on the 18th. Uh, that of the same month, this month, uh, the Tate's Creek, my niece is wound up back there, y'all. <laughs> yeah, what up, Reese? <laughs> uh, on the 18th of October here, the Tate's Creek Baptist Association will be gathering for our annual meeting, about 50 Baptist churches in central Kentucky, all gathered together as a part of this Tate's Creek Baptist Association. And we are hosting this year's annual meeting. We're the newest church in that association. And so as such, they wanted to come here and gather up. And so I'm looking forward to, that's a Tuesday night at seven o'clock. We'll be hosting the Tate's Creek Baptist Association. The, uh, our church is gonna be responsible for providing some sweets, uh, just some little things to snack on it, a little, uh, little reception after the meeting. So I'm looking forward to that as well as uh, I I get the the honor and the privilege to be this year's annual meeting speaker. And so I'm looking forward to getting to preach the word, uh, not just with you all, but with all of our brothers and sisters coming to us from across this part of the state. So exciting stuff going forward. And uh, I'm just looking forward to what this month holds for us. It is uh, a happening time here at Hyattsville Baptist Church. And uh, I hope that you are looking at how you can be a part of all that. 
That's all the announcements I've got. Oh, it's not. See, that's why Doug's back there. He's got me. Uh, also, we're going to start introducing you some members uh, in our church just periodically over the next little bit. We've had some people join kind of behind the scenes. Uh, and so we want you still to know who they are. And the first family we're introducing you to today is the York family. Uh, that's Andrew and Carly and their, their children, Mason, Hunter, and Lily. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so we are excited to have this family. They joined a few weeks back and are already looking at how they can get plugged in. They're already a part of a community group and uh, getting plugged in through our small groups ministries and are starting to, to look at other ways to serve. And so we're excited to have the Yorks with us. And uh, we look forward to being able to celebrate uh, other families that have joined here recently over the next few weeks as we kind of profile some of these who have, who have joined kind of behind the scenes. We won't make you stand up or do any of that, but we still want the church to know who you are and uh, for you to be a part of our family. And so, Doug, that is my last announcement, right? All right, cool. I turn it over to you, Dan. Good morning. Um, October is Pastor Appreciation Month, If um, for those of you that may be new here and not know that. Um, next Sunday night is Pastor Brian's favorite time of the month. It's business meeting, and you all know how much he loves that. So next Sunday night, after service, we're going to have a little get-together time to appreciate uh, Pastor Brian and Dan for the work that they do here leading us and taking care of all of us and um, it's it's like a bunch of children isn't it and so we're gonna have a little um, reception I guess you would say so next Sunday night come out help us uh, celebrate them and show our appreciation to them after uh, Sunday night business meeting and bring your favorite snack um, finger foods, whatever you want to call them, and we're going to just eat a little bit and um, just uh, enjoy celebrating with them and show our appreciation to them next Sunday night. And also, um, we're going to have a card shower for them, so if you'd like to bring a card and show your appreciation to them, uh, that's what we're going to be doing next Sunday night after business meeting. Thank you. I am up here on, t on behalf of the kids team to give some announcements about some things that we have going on here in the month of October as well. Um, we have put sign-up sheets out on our bulletin board out these doors um, for our trunk or treat. Uh, we've got a sign-up sheet for the trunks, so the people who are handing out the candy. Um, we also have some sign-up sheets for helpers uh, for our greeter table for um, inflatable supervisors and a few other things. So all of those are out here outside of these doors. Um, if you choose to participate in a trunk, there is a trunk decorating contest. I've heard that the pastor and his wife have won the last two years in a row, and I consider that a ripoff because I was Miss Frizzle and the Magic School Bus last year, and what could be better than that? But we will have a trunk decorating contest. Everybody who's there will have an opportunity to vote on um, the trunk, and there will be a little prize involved with that. We are still in need of candy. We had about 200 kids come through last year, and so it's a, a big to-do, and we want to be able to do it the right way. And so we just ask that if you are able that you would donate some candy. Um, that box can be found out in the sanctuary. And then last but not least, well, there's two other things, actually. We will not have kids ministry this Wednesday night because of fall break. We're going to give everybody an opportunity to just kind of take a breath and pause. We know that a lot of people will be out on vacation and that kind of thing. And also, if you are involved in kids or youth in any capacity, so if you're on the kids team, youth team, or if you are a Wednesday night helper, we will be having a meeting immediately after church this morning. Thank you. i 
Last night while I was sleeping You were watching over me While I dreamt about tomorrow You knew my every need Now another day is waiting For me to make it through and There's no way that I could face it Without you Before the day slips away I want to stop and say, I love you, I love you. Before the world rushes in again, I want to stop and say, there's none above you. There's none above you. I just be still and know that you are God. Be still. That you are God. There's something about the morning, the stillness of it all, that caused my heart to hear you when you gently call. Now another day is waiting for me to make it through. And there's no way that I could face it without you. Before the day turns away, I want to stop and say I love you. I love you. Before the world rushes in again, I want to stop and say there's none above you, there's none above you, I just be still and know that you are God, be still and know that you are God, here I am. Where I long to be along with you in the silence. Rain down your love and your mercy. Whisper softly to me. Before the day slips away, I want to stop and say I love you, I love you. Before the day slips away, I want to stop and say I love you, I love you. Before the day slips away, I want to stop and say I love you, I love you. Before the world rushes in again, I want to stop and say there's none above you, there's none above you. I just be still and know that you are God. 
be still and know that you are God. One of the biggest words that has been discussed over the last couple years has been the word justice. What is justice? And it's talked about on all the radio shows and the talk shows. It's, it's discussed on news programs. I looked up the definition for it. Here's what I got. Justice is the condition of being morally correct or fair. Another definition I saw that I personally like a little bit better is, you get what you deserve. It's more in my vocabulary range. You get what you deserve. That's what justice is. And at the end of the day, I would wager that every person ultimately seeks justice. We all want to see justice, and we all want to see justice, I believe, because of the same thing, and it's that we are all seeking peace. This is a reason that so many philosophers in the past have tied these two concepts together. It's the reason that many of the different uh, protests and marches we've seen over the last few years have included phrases that included the words justice and peace. It's the reason that at the end of the day, both movements like Black Lives Matter and Backing the Blue have the same end goal, even if coming at it from opposite sides at times. It's the same reason that the pro-choice and the pro-life movements both feel that they are motivated by. It's a desire for justice, for getting what people feel is deserved for the sake of peace. And while we don't always agree on what that can be accomplished through, I think we're all seeking it. We all hope to see justice because we all hope to see peace. Today, my hope and prayer is that we look at Psalm 129 and continue in our series through the Psalms of Ascent. Is that in an evil world, our only hope for justice is our righteous God. Our only hope for justice in this evil, wicked, broken, sin-soaked world is our righteous God. And I am convinced that if we don't come to this conclusion, as we continue in our journey of discipleship and in our journey through the Psalms, what we will do is we will find ourselves living out of one of two places. That if we try to find justice, seeking peace somewhere other than in our righteous God, what we'll do is we'll either live in fear or we'll live in anger. We'll live in fear because we fear that justice is not coming, that there is no one who can accomplish that. Or that we'll be trusting in worldly means for it, which will ultimately fall short at times. Even the best of peacekeepers and the best of means that this world creates to find justice inevitably fall short of creating it. That's human nature. If we don't live in fear, what we'll do is we'll live in anger. We'll be angry at the injustice we see around us. We'll be angry at the heartbreak and the brokenness. We'll be angry at the abuse and the violence. And that will, in turn, lead us down a similar path. Because when we live in fear or we live in anger for too long, inevitably what will happen is the human being will want to take it into their own hands. We will want to trust ourselves to get out of a fearful or angry situation because no one wants to live there. None of us like being angry or fearful. I mean, a look at American culture today, one might wonder if some people like to live angry. There's a lot of that going around. There's a lot of fear going around too. But unfortunately, I believe that because we... Do not trust our righteous God to deliver justice 
and bring peace. We instead live in fear. We live in anger. And that leads to violence. It leads to politics and overemphasizing what that means, particularly in the church, might I add. Leads to power struggles. And everybody wanting to get their way because their way is the way to get justice and therefore their way is the way to get peace. And I am convinced that much of the conflict we see in our country and much of the conflict we see in our churches could be resolved if we would stop trusting in ourselves for this and instead trust in a righteous God instead. And so today, our passage is Psalm 129. I want to encourage you to turn there in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, the Black View Bible is right in front of you. It will be on page 544. And in fact, if you don't have a Bible at all, please take that one right in front of you. Make it your own. Psalm 129, starting in verse 1. Psalmist says, Since my youth they have often attacked me, let Israel say. Since my youth, they have often attacked me, but they have not prevailed against me. Plowmen plowed over my back. They made their furrows long. The Lord is righteous. He has cut the ropes of the wicked. Let all who hate Zion, all who hate Israel, be driven back in disgrace. Let them be like grass on the rooftops, which withers before it can be grown up, or yours might say, before it can be pulled out. And can't even fill the hands of the reaper, the arms of the one who binds the sheaves. Then none who pass by will say, may the Lord's blessing be on you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Now, you might have noticed as we read that, that got into a pretty intense tone toward the end. We're going to talk about what that means and how as Christians we approach that. But first, let me pray. I'm going to pray for you all. You pray for me. And then we'll dive into God's word together this morning. Let's pray. Lord God, you are a righteous God. You are the one who who rules and reigns over the cosmos. You are the one who ultimately defines justice, what is right and wrong. And Lord, you've already shown up in a mighty way this morning. As we've celebrated baptism, showing the, the coming into new life from a heart that was once lost. We've Celebrated through song, Lord, and we've, we've lifted your name high that in Christ alone our hope is found. And Lord, we, we've been able to celebrate as we talk about different events and, and worship opportunities you have coming up for us as a church. But Lord, I pray that now we may celebrate what your word has to say to us. God, I pray that it's not me talking whatever is of me. I hope it's forgotten. Lord, help me not even say it, to be honest. But I pray that your word would speak and that it would find hearts that are receptive this morning, ears that are open, eyes willing to see what your word would have us to say. And I pray, Lord God, that you would work and bring about true life change. Be that from someone coming to repentance of their sins and trusting in you as Lord and Savior for the first time, or maybe it's someone else here who has been following you But you're calling them into a new step, a new phase, a new part of their walk with you. I don't know, Lord, what you're planning to do. We just ask that you would work. May your spirit fall on this room this morning, and may we see the fruit of that. It's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Psalm 129 is what they call a lament psalm. And in fact... More of the Psalms are laments than not. And so a lament is a, is a prayer of mourning or of sorrow. And a lament Psalm is going to follow a similar pattern pretty much every time. You're going to see first a, a problem presented. Then you're going to see a statement of confidence that, that God, speaking in the Psalms, is going to handle that problem. And then third, you'll see a petition, a prayer for God to do just that. And so in a, in a lament psalm, psalm will be like, oh, woe is me. Everything is terrible. But God is great and he's going to take care of it. So God, be great and take care of it. That's the general flow. And I hope that you'll see exactly that this morning as we have two points coming through Psalm 129. 
The first one is this. Our only hope against injustice is our righteous God. And we see that in verses 1 through 4. Let me read them again. It says, Since my youth they have often attacked me. Let Israel say, Since my youth they have often attacked me, but they have not prevailed against me. That right there, we could stop and just park there, but we're not going to. It says, Plowmen have furrowed over my back. They made their furrows long. The Lord is righteous. He has cut the ropes of the wicked. And if you go throughout your Bible, and in fact, we've been doing a through the Bible reading plan as a church this year, the one year Bible plan. Uh, we, we are way up in that thing at this point, diving through. I think today we should have finished Isaiah. And so we've been reading through God's word. And at this stage, if you've been on that journey with us since January, what we've done is we've seen the entire history of the Israelite people leading up to the end of the Old Testament. And we've been able to see that over and over and over again, the Israelite people faced injustice. Two big examples loom large over the Old Testament. One is, of course, the Exodus, where the Israelites were in slavery for hundreds of years to the Egyptians, working and working and working until God came in. He systematically like mollywopped all of the gods of the Egyptians and showed how he was powerful over all of them and led the Israelites out through the middle of the ocean. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool. One. Another big one that relates directly to Psalm 129 is the exile of the people of Judah. That God's people were carried away into Babylon, modern day Iraq, and they were kept there, not quite in slavery, but not quite free either, for 70 years, isolated from their home. And of course, most of those who were leaving never came back. And now we see in the Psalms of Ascent, these are the songs of the exiles as they were singing them coming back to Israel for the first time in decades. They are coming back home. And they have known injustice. They've been living in a land that is not their own for decades. Most of the people coming back had not even been alive in their homeland before. They'd been born in captivity in Babylon and were for the first time ever getting to experience a life without the oppression of the Babylonians or the Medes or the Persians or whoever else was conquering them, ruling over them. You could even include other times throughout the Old Testament with the judges and other attacks from enemy nations. The Israelite people knew well what it meant to battle against injustice. And as this psalm points out, they were never totally defeated. Be it in Egypt or be it facing the, the period of the judges when you got the, the Moabites and the Midianites and the Philistines and all the other ites coming up. Whether it's the exile and they're being led off to Babylon or crushed by Assyria, at no point in the Old Testament did God's people ever get totally defeated. There was always a remnant. And they point out, rightfully, that since their youth, since forever ago, Israel has been attacked, but they have not been prevailed against, defeated, annihilated, destroyed. And the reason being, why could they say that? Well, verse 4, the Lord is righteous. That's why. It's the same reason, by the way, that we are not Destroyed The same reason that the church, no matter what we have faced since the time of the apostles, when the Romans were stringing us up, dousing us with oil and lighting the streets of Rome with us to following into the Middle Ages, when you had the church getting all out of whack and being attacked to the time of the Moors and the Muslims coming up out of Africa and attacking the church to today, when, yes, the church in the West is on our heels and the culture is turning against us quickly. We have never been defeated. We are not defeated currently. And we are not going to be. Why? Because our God is righteous. We see this throughout the scriptures. God's righteous is all encompassing. Deuteronomy 32 puts it out that his righteousness is true. It's never false. It's never misleading. He's never inaccurate on what it means to be right. He's just always right. His righteousness is always just. He's never unfair. He's never giving what isn't deserved. He's never failing or inconsistent in his dispensation of what we deserve. He is always just. And that comes from 2 Samuel 23. In Ezra chapter 9, we see that God's righteousness is always preserving. 
that he never fails or lets his people down. He is always by our side. Just one book over in Nehemiah chapter 9, we see that our God's righteousness is faithful. And specifically that he keeps every promise he makes to you. He's going to keep it because he is righteous. And all of that ultimately, as we see in 2 Chronicles 12, shows that our God's righteousness is humbling. Because when we realize how righteous our God is, what that should do is show us how unrighteous, how unfaithful, how untrue, how unjust, how unpreserving we are. Our God, y'all, is holy and righteous always. And what that should do is that should bring us to praise his name and it should also bring us to humility to see him for who he is in light of who we are. This, by the way, should be the primary postures of the Christian people. Not anger, raging against the culture that hates us or whatever. Not fear, cowering and wondering if the church is going to be destroyed. We don't act like that. That's not what we're called to, y'all. We are called to humble ourselves before our God and to lift his name high for his glory. That is our posture. We don't cower in fear and we don't shake our fists in anger. We lift our hands high in praise and we bend the knee in humility. And isn't that God's track record? Isn't his track record always one that leads his people into humility and worship as he preserves us and is faithful to us every step of the way? I mean, I just went through it in the Old Testament. That's why the Israelite people felt like they could sing it. It's not like this was a novel concept for them to experience. They'd, not like they'd never seen the righteousness of God play out against injustice in their life. He got them to that point. By all accounts, the Israelite people should have ceased to exist way before they could be singing this song coming back from exile. And yet there they were. By all intents and purposes, this church should probably not be here, right? There's been problems here just as there has been in every church. And at any given point, the problems in a church could sink it. And yet God in his righteousness and in his grace has kept this a going. He's still got you here. He's still got me here. He's still got his church in this country. And regardless of what you might hear on the cable news or on the radio guy or whatever, God's church still stands. Evil has not won. The enemy does not stand in victory. Pretty sure we just sang a minute ago that Christ is in victory. And so while we might be able to say, along with the Israelite people, that injustice is our problem, and we usually think of physical injustices, violence and attacks, abuse, racism, murder, you name it. Our ultimate issue is spiritual injustice. And guess what? Our God's got that under control, too. The enemy is not in victory. The world is not in victory. There is only one victory, and that belongs to Christ Jesus and his people. And his righteousness is the answer to both. And so what we have to do as God's people is we must trust in who God is and not necessarily what we always see. Because when you look around, and especially depending on who you're listening to, it may not feel that you stand in victory. It may not feel like our God is in control. It may not feel like our Jesus has already defeated sin and death. But y'all, if we could see it, then it wouldn't be faith. Let me read you from Hebrews chapter 11. It says, now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. Honestly, I think that's part of the issue for the American church in a lot of ways, and maybe even for you. Is for so long, it has been easy for us to see that we are in victory because we've been the dominant voice in the culture. People have listened to the church. People have respected the church. People have cared about what the church had to say. And it's easy to feel like you are in victory and that you have got what it takes when you're already in the lead. It was a lot easier to feel like Kentucky might win the national championship at 11 yesterday than it was by three. It's 
easy when you're in the lead. Y'all, we are not in the lead. And I'll just be blunt with you, I don't think we're going to be. I pray that we will be. I pray for a revival. I pray for God's spirit to move, and it certainly could happen. God can do whatever he wants to do. If he wants to bring a third great awakening to America, wake us up and bring a pouring out of his spirit on his churches, he certainly can, and I hope he does, and hopefully you're praying for that as well. But given the direction of things, I don't think we can assume that. And so we can either wring our hands in worry, and shake our fists in anger, or we can trust that our God's in control whether what we see is what we feel or not. What that should do is it should bring us to prayer. That's what it should do. That when we see injustice in this world, when we see those things that clearly are contrary to God's righteousness, what we should do is pray to our God that he will work. And that leads us into our second point today. Our only hope for justice is in our righteous God. Listen to these, eight, these four verses again. Let all who hate Zion be driven back in disgrace. Let them be like grass on the rooftops which withers before it grows up and can't even fill the hands of the reaper or the arms of the one who binds the sheaves. Then none will pass, who pass by will say the Lord's blessing be on you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. This is imagery bringing up the idea of grass being on a rooftop. Now, I don't know about y'all, but if you got grass on your rooftop, you probably ought to get that looked at. But in Israelite culture, that was actually fairly common. They had flat rooftops that usually had dirt, and it would not be uncommon for some grass seed to blow up up there, and next thing you know, you got some grass popping up. What's even weirder is that's also where they used to sleep, so I don't know how that works out, but that's what the experts say used to happen. But that grass would very rarely ever grow out on the rooftop for very long because there wasn't a whole lot of dirt up there for it to grow out of. Not to mention it was at the most exposed point, and so it would get direct sunlight. And between the shallow dirt and the intense sun, usually what would happen, that grass would die. Just like if you put some sod out and dirt ain't quite right, got too much rock underneath it, hot summer day hits it, dead, and you're just wasting your money. Similar concept. And what we see here is what the scholars call an imprecatory psalm. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, imprecatory. That's yeah, some of you did. Here's what an imprecatory psalm is. An imprecatory psalm is a prayer to God to deliver justice. That's what it is. Think about praying this prayer. Let all who hate your people be driven back in disgrace. Doesn't that sound a little bit aggressive? Like there's part of me that reads that and I'm like, am I supposed to pray that? Am I supposed to pray? Let them wither, God. That sounds hardcore. Here's, here's what I know. The Israelites trusted their God to handle the enemy. And in fact, we see here, as one commentator put it, in this short four verses, we see a prayer for God's enemies, for the enemies of God's people to be shamed, defeated, few in number, short-lived, and without his blessing. That is a hardcore prayer. But you'll notice they're not saying, God, help us do that. They're saying, God, you handle them, not us. See, an imprecatory psalm, and there's a lot of them, if you read through your psalms. There's a lot of psalms where it's like, bash the heads of their children. And I'm like, what? I can't say that. But it is a trust, an open prayer of trust for God to handle whatever it is and bring justice so that way we can handle our part. That's what it is. And you might be thinking, well, what is our part? Well, our part is not to be the punisher and go handle and deal out judgment ourselves. We are not the judge and executioner. No, instead, Jesus had something else for us. If you look in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, he said, You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. 
For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors, don't, doesn't everybody love the people who like them? Jesus points out, if you only greet your brothers and sisters, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles, don't even those who don't worship God do that? Be perfect, therefore, as the heavenly father is perfect. What Jesus is saying is that it, as a Christian, our job is not to love the people like us and hate the people against us. Everybody does that. That's why we got like 16 different cable news channels now. They started out with two of them because they couldn't get along. And now they've splintered off off of those because they can't even get along within their own one channel. And some of them can't even get along on TV, so they're on YouTubes or podcasts or radios. There's a billion different now. Why? Because nobody wants to love their enemies. That's why. So we just keep isolating further and further and further and further, finding whoever it is that we can agree with everything with. That also, if we're just being honest, can we, can we just real talk with y'all? That's why we got a whole bunch of different churches too, right? It's not because we were like, oh, let's advance the gospel by putting a whole bunch of different churches all throughout Garrett County. No, it's because we said, I don't like you, so I'm going to go for, start the, uh, the second Baptist church. And then they got mad and they said, well, we'll be the Freedom Baptist Church because we're now free of all y'all scoundrels. <laughs> and that ain't a shout out to the real Freedom Baptists. I don't know how they got there, but I just know that liberty and freedom are pretty close to each other. So I don't know what's going on. I kid, but, but kind of not. Like that's, that is why we have a billion different churches. Very rarely is it because we're wanting to reach new areas. Instead, it's because we got mad. And we counted brothers and sisters as enemies. And so we split off from them. And that's not the way of the Lord. I heard one speaker the other day put it this way. Why is it that we have... 250 different tables to come and worship together under when at the marriage supper of the Lamb we're all going to be at the same one. That's at least something to think on. That ain't what I'm supposed to be preaching on. I just I got off track. It's what Jesus modeled in the story of the Good Samaritan too, by the way. The Samaritans were the people who were least like the Israelite people. They were mortal enemies, hating each other on default. And that's why Jesus specifically chose the Samaritan as the right example in a story he was telling to Jewish people. If you were to tell that story today in central Kentucky in a church, you might tell that story by bringing up a Republican or Democrat, depending on what church you're in. You might bring that up by using as the right example Presbyterian or a Methodist, depending on what church you're in. We so often draw these lines and create the other. Who is my neighbor? It's not just the person who believes like you, votes like you, looks like you, sounds like you, listens to the same music as you, and pulls for the same football team as you. Even Tennessee volunteers are our neighbors. Here's how we walk out of this as we close out today. Two applications. The first one is this. We have a clear command to love our enemies. And frankly, our enemies need us to love them. Think about it. If they are an enemy of the church, then yes, they may be standing against what we stand for, but they are also almost assuredly lost. And that is a human being made in the image of God who needs the grace of the Lord Jesus in their life. And how are they going to get it if we as the church make them the enemy? I'll answer that. They're not. The more people we decide to isolate off and not associate with as the church of Jesus Christ are people we are effectively saying, I hope you go to hell. And if that feels too strong, it's not. Because if we are not willing to love our enemies, what we are doing is we are instead damning them to pay for their sins instead of introducing them to the one who paid for those sins. 
It may be helpful to remind us what Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says. This, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so you can stand against the schemes of everybody who doesn't believe like us. No, that's not what it says. It says so we can stand against the schemes of the devil. In fact, verse 12 goes further and says our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Translation, your struggle is not against other people. At the end of the day, the enemies of the church are not other people, even if they think they're the enemies of the church. Even if they think, well, if anything, I could shut down what the church is doing. Even if they vote differently than us, even if they believe differently than us, even if they look differently than us, even if they act in a way that is specifically targeting Hyattsville Baptist Church. If there were someone out there who wanted nothing more than to see Hyattsville Baptist Church burn to the ground, they are not our enemy. The devil is. We are called to love flesh and blood. Those who would be enemies within the human race. We put on the armor of God to stand against the works of the devil. And we are called to love those opposed to the Lord amongst our people. That's not easy. That's not how we tend to think. But again, that's the mind of Christ. That's the mind that goes contrary to the world. The world likes who is like the world. It's our job to love everyone, regardless of whether they're like us. What that means is if we're focusing on that, we don't have time for us to deal out justice ourselves. We don't have time for us to be the ones holding everyone accountable. We don't have time to be the ones pointing our fingers and wagging them and saying, shame, shame. You're bad because of whatever. Instead, we turn it all over to the Lord God. We trust that our God is big enough to handle it. That he is big enough to take care of whatever stands in front of us. That he is big enough to handle whatever comes at his church. That he is going to take care of the rest. When we don't, we're effectively saying we're stronger than he is. And I don't think any of us want to be in the spot where we're saying we're stronger than the Lord God. That's a dangerous place to be. I want to close. I know, I said I was closing a minute ago. I really am this time. In Isaiah chapter 52. And I want you to hear this as if you've never heard it before. I bet you have. But if you haven't. Let this wash over you for a minute. Isaiah 52, starting in verse 13, says, See, my servant will be successful. He will be raised and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were appalled at you, his appearance was so disfigured, he did not look like a man, and his form did not resemble a human being. So he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths because of him, for they will see what had not been told them. And they will understand what they had not heard. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of suffering, a man of sorrows, as your translation may put it, who knew what sickness was. He was like... Someone people have turned away from or hiding their faces from. He was despised and we didn't value him. And yet he himself bore our sicknesses. He carried our pains. We in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God, afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion. Crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him. And we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity, the sins, the wrongdoing, the injustice of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to slaughter and like a sheep silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? 
for he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was a rich man at his death because he had done no violence. He had not spoken deceitfully. And yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a guilt offering, you will see his seed. And he will prolong his days. And by his hand, the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. And after his anguish, he will see the light and be satisfied. And by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. And he will carry their iniquities. And therefore, we give him the many as a portion. And he will receive the mighty as a spoil. Because he willingly submitted to death and was counted among the rebels. And yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. Isaiah, of course, prophesying hundreds of years about a man of sorrows, about someone who is going to be completely righteous, completely good, and yet face the judgment, the punishment, the wrath, the, frankly, injustice on behalf of everyone who was unjust. I don't think I have to outline it, but I will. He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about our Lord. He's talking about you and me, by the way, as the ones whose injustice had to be paid for, as the ones whose evil and, in fact, outright fighting against the Lord had to be handled. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall astray. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and therefore are unjust and evil. And that means that Jesus had to face evil injustice to give you his righteousness that is the gift of our Jesus that is the gift of our suffering servant that when we least deserved it he gave us grace anyway you'll notice why he did it by the way he faced injustice he brought righteousness. Why? To bring about peace. To bring about the very thing every one of us is searching for. To bring about that tranquility, that shalom, as we've talked about it, that all-encompassing thriving of life that God is bringing through restoration. And it all started with Jesus on the cross, dying an unjust death. So I ask you this morning. He suffered injustice. For you. He defeated evil for you. Will you trust him to set it all straight? Or will you keep taking it in your own hands? Let's pray. Father God, I pray this morning, Lord, that we would trust you. God, I, I pray that I know there are those of us in this room who feel those feelings of fear and anger, who see a, a world turned against us and we're tempted to view whoever those people are, whoever we imagine when I say that, we, we tend to view them as our enemies. Lord, I, I turn that over to you. Whoever we view as our enemies, I pray, Lord, that you would handle it and that you would free us up from trying to take care of it ourselves, and instead we would simply love them while we wait for your justice or your grace, however you and your sovereignty dispense it. I pray, Lord, this morning that maybe there is someone here who is still living in their injustice, still living in their evil, still living in their wrongdoing. They have not turned from their sins and trusted in you, and therefore they will face that wrath someday. They will face punishment someday. Lord, I pray that you would change their hearts right now. Lead them to the point where they repent of their sins, where they say, Lord, I cannot face your judgment, and so I trust you to give me life. Lord, I, I pray over our time of communion, over our time of response today, Lord, that we would lift your name high as we reflect on the goodness of God. It's in your name we pray our Messiah, the suffering servant, Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time, we are going to go into our time of communion, of doing the Lord's Supper.
And so as our deacons come forward, I encourage you to examine yourself and to reflect on what this means. If you're not a member of Hyattsville Baptist Church, but you are a believer, we do encourage you to take it with us anyway. Uh, we, we always, you know, want to bring everyone to the table, regardless of whether you're a Hyattsville member or not. If you're not a believer, though, I do ask you to abstain. The Bible, in fact, warns with pretty severe consequences. If you are not a believer and you take the table wrongly, it may lead to serious illness and wrath from the Lord God. As such, this is also not snack time for the kids. I will, I, we have this on Family Worship Sunday specifically so that you might be able to point your kids to what this means. It's a visual representation of the gospel and of what Jesus Christ did for us. But if they are not yet believers, I ask that you would not allow them to partake in this cup and in the bread. That you would let it pass by. If they need a snack, hit us up. We got some cookies. We'll figure it out. But as our deacons come around, spend this time in prayer and in reflection. book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we see Paul writing out on behalf of the Lord God the instructions for the Lord's Supper. It says that on the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took the bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
In the same way also, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Sam, would you pray over us, please? Amen. As we come into a time of response, it's worth noting that this final verse on the instructions of the Lord's Supper says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that is what we do in the Lord's Supper. And that's the death I hope you're responding to as we all stand now and sing. This is a time for us to stand and to respond as God has led. And so maybe he's leading you to take that first step of faith. And to declare that you follow Jesus for the very first time. Maybe he's following you to, he's calling you to, to follow in Miss Teresa's footsteps and declare to the world through baptism that you are his. Or maybe he's calling you into church membership or some sort of leadership or ministry role in some capacity. I don't know what God's calling you to, but he is calling you to respond and proclaim that death. How that looks in your life, that is up to you in this time. Don't let it pass by, and let's respond. Mike, whatever. I'm excited to be able to uh, introduce you all. You may have met them, you may not, but this is David and Kayla and Walker. Uh, they are coming to us on a statement of faith this morning. Uh, they've been coming for quite a bit here lately. They're already involved in a community group with us on Sunday mornings. And so if you are excited as they come and join our membership today, let's make some noise and celebrate what God is doing. <laughs> Thank you. 
Amen. Amen. So the Williams family will be up here uh, right after service. So if you want to come and give them, just extend the right hand of fellowship and welcome them into the family formally. Uh, it's always exciting when someone who's been attending for a little bit uh, comes and takes that, that step to formally say, yo, we're jumping in with y'all. We're in and amongst you. And so uh, good luck to you. But we, we are glad to have you with us. And uh, our time of response doesn't end right here. You know, if you're feeling called to, to join the church or follow through in baptism or, or even stepping out to trust Jesus for the first time, I'll be at the back here in just a second. I'd love to encourage you. Come talk to me, talk to one of our deacons, talk to somebody, and uh, we'll be able to help you uh, make whatever step in faith you need to make today. Uh, of course, remember tonight at 6 o'clock, come on back for our Operation Christmas Child celebration. Uh, I'd love to see Hyattsville have a good show out for this tonight as we celebrate what God is doing through Operation Christmas Child. I hope to see you this evening at 6 o'clock. And of course, if you help with kids ministry, uh, with youth ministry, if you're around on Wednesday nights in that part of the church at all, uh, please just meet us over on this side. Uh, and We're going to have a real quick meeting. It, it, you will not miss out on lunch, I promise. It'll be very quick. We just got to make a couple announcements for those ministries. So with all that, Sean, there you are. Will you pray us out, brother? What a crowd today. You know, I can't, I, I, it was my day to pray, and I thought, well, it's fall break. There won't be that many here. But look, of course, of course, you all. Uh, i just like to say before I pray us out, uh, talk to Janie, Miss Janie, this morning, and uh, uh, you know, she's had a, it's been a tough year for Miss Janie. She lost a, a son-in-law uh, at a young, young age, and she's now just just recently lost a brother-in-law. And uh, you know, speaking to her just as being Christians, what what a blessing to have Christ to lean on in those hard times. But on the other side of it, if, if you've been struggling with whether you need you, you, you haven't decided or if you need to decide to follow Christ, you know, we are not promised another minute in our life. And uh, there's no greater, no greater thing that you could do than to, to follow Christ. It, and uh, Miss Janie's, you know, even though she's got grief in her heart, she was smiling and talking to me about it. And just, it just, you could just see that she had Christ in her heart and, and that she was leaning on him for, for comfort. Anyway, that being said, uh, let us pray and we'll get out of here. Heavenly Father, just what an what a awesome day here in your house, Lord. Uh, uh, we started, uh, I'm thankful for our new sister, Teresa, and we ended with the Williams family joining our flock here, Lord. I'm just, just so thankful for that, Lord. Uh, yeah, Psalm 84 says, blessed are those who dwell in your house, Lord. And, and we are so blessed to be able to be here uh, today. I'm just so thankful for what you're doing in my life. I just feel like that you had prepared me all week for this this message, uh, that uh, uh, just that through hard times, tough times, uh, you know that uh, you are there always for us, Lord, and that we can lean on you, Lord. Uh, uh, just there's so much going on in this this crazy world uh, that I just pray that as a church that we can put on our spiritual armor. And, and to me, that just is, you know, speaking to you daily, pray, uh, reading your word daily, praying, Lord. I just pray that how powerful that could be if we as a church would do that and put that spiritual armor on. And, and I, I, I'm guilty of anger. I, I, I tend to get angry with what's going on in the world. And I feel like you have prepared me this week and, and been speaking to me and trying to get me to put that spiritual armor on and do those things and, instead of being angry, Lord. And I'm just so thankful for that, Lord. Lord, there's a lot going on in the world. Uh, the people in Florida, here we are today in the comforts of our life that nothing, you know, everything's just hunky-dory here. But there are many, many down in Florida and, and up the coast that have lost their homes, their businesses, and, and even worse than that, lost loved ones, Lord. I just pray that you would be with those people and and maybe this would just be a great awakening, a time that we look to you, Lord, and people do look to you and change their lives, Lord. Uh, Lord, be with us through the rest of this day. Uh, we love you, love you dearly. It's in these things, your son's precious and holy name I pray. Amen.